the books that people did continue to discuss, um, but which were ultimately agreed on, um, all came from what we would call the back of the New Testament. Um, Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and the book of Revelation. Mm. Well, if you want to talk about those books, I'm happy to. Uh, but what's interesting is... Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and we have a great show. Great show today. We're going to be talking about the New Testament, the reliability of the New Testament, and uh, it's not just going to be me, but an expert in the field, uh, Dr. Craig Blomberg. He's a husband uh, to his wife. He's got two daughters and three grandchildren as well. He has written vast on this subject. He's many, many books. We'll put those books in the description and we'll talk a lot about that. So we're going to be talking about the reliability of scripture, how we got the Bible, how we got the canon, and uh, several other things that many skeptics and even other stripes, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, will use either for or against their particular tradition. Welcome to the show, Dr. Blomberg. How you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah. No, thanks for taking the time. Uh, so you're you're in you're in Denver Seminary. You've been there since the 1980s. Is that correct? 1986. Yes. Wow. Great. Well, I like I shared a moment ago before we went on. I've read your work. Um, of course, the reliability of the New Testament. That's one of the, I, I think, very important books. Um, and you've got you've written many many others on different subjects, different books of the Bible. And so again, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, why don't we just jump right in? Uh, we've got, uh, and I, I didn't learn this until very recently. I, I heard a lot of skeptics, you know, in college and just around the internet and friends and things um, say, well, you know, we can't really trust the Bible because it was, it was created, especially the New Testament. Usually they say Bible, usually they're referencing just the New Testament so often. Um, you know, it, it was a lot of gospels. There was a lot of this. They, the church picked the, the, the Bible, uh, you know, in the fourth century, the fifth century, you know, Nicaea, Chalcedon, F Ephesus, all these. And they use that as a reason not to believe the Bible. A man picked the Bible, right? Well, recently, <laughs> that same argument has been used by Roman Catholics, both to me directly and indirectly, and just kind of Twitter debates and other things that I shouldn't get myself into. Uh, but also using that as the same argument to trust the Roman Catholic Church and trust the Bible. So can you just kind of flesh out for us how we got our New Testament and, and you know, when the bulk of it was written uh, and, and, and all the rest? What do you got? <laughs> well, as the uh, professor in me feels he has to intrude and say, if anybody talks about Nicaea, or Chalcedon, or Ephesus, they've got totally the wrong councils, and they haven't even started to do their historical homework. Nicaea was all about the Trinity, and Chalcedon was about the two natures of Christ, uh, divine and human nature, and Ephesus applied that a little bit further against some people that were deemed to be teaching falsely at the time. So if you want to talk about councils that discuss the uh, books of the New Testament, you go to the 390s and to two cities in North Africa, one by the name of Carthage and the other by the name of Hippo. But then you have to go backwards from there. Um, the bishops that came together did not um, say, hey, we got all these individual books that we treasure that some of us talk about as being inspired or sacred let's uh, let's create an official <clears throat> excuse me an official list already in 363 um, Athanasius had written um, as bishops tended to do in those days a circular letter around the empire um, at Easter time and said, these are the 27 books, and he rattled off Matthew through Revelation that um, are agreed upon everywhere by everybody. Well, that was a bit of a rhetorical exaggeration, but <laughs> by the middle of the fourth century, um, 
it was largely a, a true statement. Um, and go back from there <clears throat> and you quickly get back um, in the early fourth century and before when there is no um, Christian Roman Empire. The church doesn't have any um, power base mm. uh, to pontificate from. Uh, and so 180, jumping uh, more than a century, you find Irenaeus saying there's four gospels. There's uh, the book of Acts. There are all these letters of Paul, um, First Peter, First John, that are pretty much undisputed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the books that people did continue to discuss, um, but which were ultimately agreed on, um, all came from what we would call the back of the New Testament. Um, Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and the book of Revelation. Mm. Well, if you want to talk about those books, I'm happy to. Uh, but what's interesting is you can put together a pretty thorough and complete understanding of Jesus and Christianity if all you have is the Gospels and Acts and <clears throat> the letters of Paul and First mm -hmm. Peter and First John. So in a period when Christians sporadically were persecuted by various Roman emperors, when books um, that would come to be part of the New Testament uh, were banned and anybody who was caught holding on to one of these was subject to punishment, uh, exile, sometimes even death. Mm. Um, Christians had to have already been thinking, which of these works is unique enough that if I had to, I would die for it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's not something you tend to hear in the revisionist version of the story. And then I keep going back through the second century and all of the different Christian writings uh, that we have, almost all of which were in keeping with the, the tradition of the teaching of the apostles and the, the books we call the New Testament. Um, and I start to see them uh, being quoted. Mm. And sometimes they're quoted as scripture. Sometimes they're quoted as on a par with the already existing Hebrew scriptures, what Christians would call the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and pretty soon I find myself on the threshold of the first century when these 27 books were first written. Um, and the idea that some council or group of <clears throat> councils years later um, arbitrarily named some and not others uh, just goes out the window as, as total fiction. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, so why, I guess, yeah, let's talk a little bit more, just expand the back of the New Testament, as you said, as it were, with Revelation and 2nd and 3rd John and Peter and all that, 2nd uh, Peter. Why were those not as early on? Now, you say you, with, with uh, Athanasius in the 360s, that was already accepted, etc. cetera. Um, but before that, in the 180s with Irenaeus, why was that still like, well, you know, we're not really sure? Because that's where some people might point to and say, see, it's not Bible, therefore blank. Or see, we have to mature it and make it acceptable or, or something like that. What's going on there? I know you mentioned persecution. At, at the else? risk of being very simplistic for the sake of time, um, there was no one uh, originally who whose name appeared on the oldest documents of Hebrews. And so there were debates about authorship from mm -hmm. earliest times. That was the biggest issue there um, for the book of James uh, Martin Luther in the 1500s was not the first person to ever notice that James could be read as intention with the apostle Paul on faith and works. And so that issue was debated from early times on. Mm. Um, second Peter 
is written in the Greek in a completely different style from First Peter. Is it plausible to say the same writer did both of those? Second and third John and Jude um, are just incredibly short. Yeah. Second and third John seem to be written to private individuals. Um, do those books have timeless truth for the entire church for all ages? And then Revelation, not surprisingly, um, elicited all kinds of interpretations from the earliest days onward. Really? Not because, like today at all, right? I mean, every, yeah. we're all exactly... There, were um, one step there have been a few <laughs> new interpretations people have come up with over the years, but most of them find their antecedents in the early church. And so there was some impetus in some circles simply not to deal with that mm -hmm. issue. Gotcha. But for the sake of comparison, we we actually have somewhere around 30 different lists uh, in varying degrees of completeness of what different Christians from the second through the sixth centuries compiled. Mm -hmm. And the number who would um, not just <clears throat> raise questions, but actually disagree with accepting any of those seven books is like three or four at most. Mm. And the number of lists that add um, otherwise orthodox second century writings um, are like three or four at most. Um, what is a lot in the, in the public eye and has been uh, since it was discovered in the late 1940s, all of the Gnostic literature, mm -hmm. Um, as far as we can tell, these weren't being put forward by anybody, um, not even the Gnostic writers themselves. Now, maybe <laughs> we've lost something, yeah. uh, but uh, we don't actually have explicit sayings uh, from the Gnostic writers saying, hey, this is our canon, not what you guys have. Yeah. If anything, they tried to attribute their writings to already respected Orthodox Christian authors, probably because they knew uh, they could never get a hearing unless some people believed that that's where they came from. Right. So that would be like the Gospel of Thomas. Hmm. Of course, Thomas was, you know, the doubting Thomas, the guy with the, you know, I'm going to see Jesus resurrected. I'm not going to believe otherwise. And of course, Gospel of Judas uh, those are all second century. Are there any into the third century as well? Or are they all? Oh, the... Yeah. Okay. Second through, if, if you get a hold of uh, a collection of what sometimes is called the New Testament Apocrypha, um, which has nothing to do with the Old Testament Apocrypha, the books that Catholics canonize and Protestants don't. Mm -hmm. New Testament Apocrypha just refers to other works of the same literary genres, gospels, acts, letters, and apocalypses, you will f find collections um, that range from the second to the sixth centuries. Wow. Wow. I didn't know it went that late. Um, no, that's great. So, so you're saying there, there were, there were minimum lists of all 27 books that we have today in 2023 okay. And, and or less. There weren't any other lists running around that were like, oh, no, we need to include Judas. We need to include, you know, the gospel of, of Barnabas and this and this and this. Although, did you mention there were, were a couple other kind of variant lists? Is that right? Or am I misunderstanding? There, there are lists that contain the same books that all Christians today would agree on that might suggest that... Um, an early second century document called the teaching of the 12 apostles. Sometimes it's just called by the Greek word for teaching the Didache. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You can find two or three uh, people suggested. Maybe that was worthy of inclusion. Um, not the gospel of Barnabas, but the epistle that was written mid second century. Oh, okay. Falsely attributed to Barnabas, but again, largely orthodox. There were people um, 
who said, yeah, maybe it belongs in there. And so, yes, there were three or four other books that occasionally got a vote or two, okay. but uh, nothing compared, not even remotely close to the, the support for the 27 that we have. Gotcha. So I get why, and maybe I already know the question answered, but why would someone like, I, I, got, I mentioned earlier, I watched a young guy who's talking why he's Roman Catholic. And it's just a video that popped up in my stream on, on YouTube here. And, um, you know, that was one of his arguments. As I said, skeptics have used that against, well, I'm not going to believe the Bible. It's just all, you know, man-made in the late fourth century. And it's compiled. It's not God's word. Why would Roman Catholics use that as justification to say, see, see, well, I mean, you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, the informed Roman Catholic would know every bit as much uh, as any other historian that um, the early church, uh, before any part of it was ever called Protestant, mm -hmm. um, developed criteria for discussing and uh, certifying, endorsing books for the New Testament. Uh, criteria such as could the book be traced to an apostle or a close associate of an apostle? Um, did it seem to have widespread relevance around the Christian world and not be just uh, the uh, poster child of some small sect uh, tucked away in a corner? Mm -hmm. um, did it have both <clears throat> internal consistency and did it seem to... Uh, continue the narrative that uh, the Hebrew scriptures had started. Um, one of the fascinating things about the, the Gnostic texts is how either non-Semitic or blatantly anti-Semitic they are. Mm. Um, they either just don't talk about Judaism or the history of Israel, or they really minimize its value. Um, so, uh, uh, informed Roman Catholic historian will say, of course, the early church used criteria, and some of them were more subjective. Uh, a sense of the Spirit is leading me in ways when I read this book that doesn't happen when I read some of the other books. There is just this ring of truth and a sense of inspiration. But they will also acknowledge that if I want a level of assurance, a level of certainty um, that goes beyond that, um, I'm going to have to trust somebody else's decision. Mm. Now, the irony is... Uh, it really doesn't bring um, a greater level of certainty. Um, but the idea, um, and I've had the conversations that you've had too, the idea of an unbroken institution going back to the beginning of the Christian movement that at various times early on, after much thought and prayer and consultation among its leaders declared officially, these are the books and no others, um, gives some people, uh, and it probably is related in part to personality types, um, the sense that, well, right, I, I throw in my lot with this camp mm -hmm. and it can't yeah. get any better than that. <laughs> yeah. But then we have to ask, do we have reason to believe that uh, all of those people involved um, were more inspired by the Spirit, were more in touch with God's leading, were more aware of how to sift through the options than... Um, a similar group of scholars and church leaders say at uh, the time of the Protestant Reformation mm -hmm. or a certain group of people in the 19th, 20th or 21st centuries. And there is something to be said for um, 
the older the source, the more likely they may well have preserved something that got lost later. But it, it really doesn't um, create more certainty. I would say it creates an illusion of certainty. Mm. Um, and I, my, my wife has, uh, has some relatives um, who have, uh, we've had some of these conversations. Uh, she was raised Roman Catholic. And, um, and they will just say, and I don't, I don't mean by this next comment to be um, unkind uh, because it's probably not representative. But, but this woman would say, I just want to have a trusted authority who tells me what to believe, who tells me what to do, and here's a way I can get that. Mm. I've seen that a lot too. Yeah, more and more. It's, yeah. And my upbringing is exactly the reverse. Um, yeah. Apparently, in some cases, I only learned this years later. Apparently, I had the reputation for being quite the questioning kid in school. And even to the point of occasionally frustrating teachers when I would ask, well, how do you know that's true? Yeah. Um, and it usually frustrated them when they couldn't give an answer. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, that's true. That I mean, I, I mean, that goes down to epistemology, right? I have, you know, fancy <clears throat> word of just knowing, and really having the certainty. And I mean, we all we all do live on some level of faith, even the most, you Absolutely. know, Rich, Richard Dawkins type or Neil deGrasse Tyson skeptic type guy to the most, you know, devout follower of Christ. There's everybody has some level of faith in all sorts of things. All day long, whether you go out to eat and you eat the food or your car or sitting in a bed or, you know, what somebody said about the past or 100 years ago, scientist or theologian a thousand years ago. I mean, on and on and on. We all have to believe lots of things all day long. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. You'll, you won't even get out of your room, out of your bed because you won't even <laughs> you won't be able to believe anything. How do I really know? How do I know that the water is not going to boil my skin at the shower? How do I know? I don't know. We I've, I've been driving since. uh I was 15, so I guess that means uh, for the last 52 years, and I have never once checked underneath my car before I started out to see if somebody planted a bomb there. (laughs) But the son of a friend of mine who has worked for the Associated Press in Lebanon for many years does that regularly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I live by faith, and thus far, that faith seems to have been well-founded. But if I went to a totally different context and somebody told me that faith isn't a good kind of faith to have here, then I would quickly switch gears. Yeah, yeah. No pun intended. Right? Um, <laughs> what A little bonus question, well, and we won't get into eschatology too much, but just curious, with Revelation and you being a New Testament scholar, uh, what... Do you do you take more of a futurist or a preterist, partial preterist? And a lot of people, I talk about eschatology quite a bit on this channel, not a ton, but quite a bit. Um, you know, millennial, post millennial, pre millennial, a millennial. Where do you square with that? Just as personal, Craig Blomberg, Christian Craig Blomberg. Where do you where do you? Land I am a futurist who appreciates elements of preterism, idealism, and historicism, and I am a post-tribulational premillennialist. Okay, nice. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Um, all right, so main, second main question, really kind of looking at, again, how we got the Gospels, and there was a few kind of contenders-ish of other people with other lists, but they weren't very popular. What do we need to do? How do we need to add? Should we add this? Should we do this? Um, what kind of flesh out a little bit more the gospel controversy, right? We got Dan Brown, what, 15 years ago with Da Vinci Code. And that's not the only thing. There's multiple places and people and skeptics and this and that. And again, I've heard recently, even from Roman Catholics mouths that, well, there were several, there were a couple hundred gospels and the church decided it was going to be these four, as if there was only going to be four places and not 10 places or 50 places why not include all of them i ask i don't know so can you flesh out like 
were there really was there i mean it probably kind of goes back to the question we just touched on um but give it explain that for us a little bit more it's it's amazing um it's actually been 20 years now 2003 when dan brown first came out with the da vinci code and i don't know if in the history of the world there has been a work of fiction that more people have read and believed it to be fact than the Da Vinci Code. The cover has the subtitle, a novel mm -hmm. in rather small print. The frontispiece page is incredibly deceptive because it says all references to ancient people, places, and events in this book are true, when in fact wow. very few of them are. Hmm. The best I can credit Brown with is that that was part of the fiction, just like I might decide I want to write a sequel to the Lord of the Rings and I will enter into the worldview of J.R.R. Tolkien and talk about things being true in Middle Earth in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. But that's when you have reason to think your readership understands what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is, if you can't find somebody before 2003 that has said something, do not, prima facie, believe it. Mm -hmm. There's a very good chance they are borrowing, whether they know it or not, from Dan Brown's fiction. Wow. If the question about the Gospels is how many other narratives do we have and by a narrative, I mean a, a book that, however selectively, talks about um, events from someone's life over a period of time in broadly chronological order, may or may not start with the person's birth and upbringing, but probably like people regularly did in the ancient Mediterranean world, uh, has a particularly detailed focus on why and how they died, mm -hmm. then the number of other narratives besides Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we have is zero. Mm. Mic drop. Boom. <laughs> now, they probably existed because we do have second and third century uh Orthodox Christian authors mm -hmm. who talk about a gospel of the Nazarenes from the snippets of things they say about. It sounds like it was a very Jewish Christian document. Maybe uh, somebody who took the gospel of Matthew and selectively edited it so that there wouldn't be anything anywhere that would offend uh, Jewish unbeliever. Hmm. Um, there are references <clears throat> to one or two other works that don't give scholars any reason to think they were written in the first century. Um, you mentioned a while back um, the Gospel of Barnabas. That is a document that we have not discovered um, portions of earlier than the 14th century, okay. but it rewrites again the story of Matthew so that Jesus is a Muslim prophet. Mm. And Convenient. Islam in many circles believes that in fact, this is the true and original story mm. um, about Jesus. After that, there's just nothing out there. Mm -hmm. What we do have are a handful of 
narrative works that focus on just one small portion of Jesus' life. There are what are called infancy gospels right. that try to imaginatively, usually with all kinds of fanciful miracles, imagine, uh, with apologies to Batman and Robin, Jesus the boy wonder. <laughs> um, there are um, additional passion gospels that equally creatively try to uh, imagine um, more that must have been going on that led up to Jesus' death and resurrection, including what is descent into hell involved. Mm. And then um, what people usually have heard of, you mentioned the Gospel of Thomas and others, are various Gnostic writings that are not narratives at all, hmm. but collections of sayings, short speeches, parables, monologues, dialogues between supposedly the risen Jesus and selected individuals or groups of his followers. Um, and the topics that are talked about in these books, with a handful of important exceptions, tend to be uh, the things Gnostics were interested in, like cosmology, the story of creation. Where did sin and evil come from? What's the solution to that? How many unseen beings are there in the universe? What's their mm -hmm. relationship? Are wow. some of them good and some of them evil? Um, and so you get works that are, are very blatantly discussing uh, Gnostic theological questions. Um, if you put all of those things that are ever called gospel, however loosely, um, by genuine scholars, you might manage to bring the number up to a couple of dozen. Oh, wow. So but it wasn't 200 is what you're saying. Nowhere close. Not even close. Okay. I, I did that number didn't sound right when I heard it. I've heard it, I think, two different places. And I was just like, really? I don't, I man, I know that story sounds pretty fishy to begin with, but I didn't think it was that many. But yeah, wow. Hmm. Um, what? I guess, I mean, is there any benefit to reading any of these? Do you think like, you know, somebody might glean something from it or, or would you say, nah, that's all just, that's all just nonsense. A uh, man who, uh, when I was starting my studies was um, retiring from a distinguished career as a New Testament professor, F.F. F. Bruce, who spent most of uh -huh. his career in Manchester once wrote a, a book on the uh, sayings of Jesus outside the gospels and uh a passage that he included in there um, that is worth quoting to this day is most important reason for reading some of this literature is to see how different it is. Mm. Um, it's only when you're listening to other people speak secondhand and you don't have any firsthand uh, experience to, to judge what they say by that uh, you start to be tempted into thinking, oh, there, there might be other gospels just as good or reliable or useful as the four. Um, I know it's an exaggeration to make the point, but I'll make it anyway. I would suspect that 99 out of 100 people who seriously read, and you can find them all online incredibly easy and you don't have to pay a cent, Mm -hmm. um, who actually sat down after they knew something about the four Gospels in the Bible, um, or even before, if, as long as they went on to read the four Gospels in the Bible, would say, yeah, I can see how passage A might have influenced passage D, but <laughs> not that often. Most of this is just two different worldviews. Mm. Wow. And I guess just for the audience, people probably know, but uh, give a kind of just a quick definition of just Gnostic in general. Gnosticism was uh, 
philosophical and religious movement that uh, grew out of uh, Greek philosophical thought, especially the writings uh, uh, four and five centuries before the time of Christ of Plato and influencing uh, his disciple Socrates, mm -hmm. um, in which there is a sharp divide between the material and the immaterial world. There is the assumption that anything that is material is inherently and irredeemably evil. Mm. So that no one would ever want to live for eternity with a resurrected body. They hope for a disembodied immortality of the soul. And redemption is not about trusting in Jesus or any other savior figure. Redemption is recognizing the spark of divinity that is embedded deeply in every human being and fanning it into flame <clears throat> and then supplementing and complementing that with um, the Gnostic philosophical literature that enables you to know who you really are, who other people are, um, and how you can live even while you're still stuck with your body, how you can sort of transcend mm. um, bodily existence. Um, it was not a full-blown worldview um, in the first century, uh, but pieces of it were coming together. And mm -hmm. by early second century, you do get some writers whose works have been preserved. Valentinus is maybe the most famous who begin to ar articulate this. Um, but it very much is parasitic and dependent on the Christian gospel having already been established. And these are the ways that people now wanted to, uh, in part, dissent from it. Mm. Gotcha. There's a lot of talk, or at least some talk. Um, uh, is John, especially in his epistles, uh, or even in the gospel, is he writing kind of against some of this proto, or uh, um, like, not proto, but new Gnosticism, yeah. these, these baby Gnostics, <clears throat> basically? It's Especially if you date uh, John's works, as I would, um, to the late 80s or early 90s. Um, you're getting close enough in time now to where uh, these things are found. If he was um, ministering in his old age in and around Ephesus, as mm -hmm. tradition says, um, you're in a location close to where some of these developments are starting to be found. So that's where it perhaps becomes most relevant. Okay. Now, I, I didn't include it here, but since you brought it up, why do you take a later, quote unquote, later time, a later date for John's work? You said late 80s, early 90s. Just because that seems to mesh best with the testimony that we have from the early church fathers. And I have not seen any reasons to uh, reject it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, last question or last primary question. Um, how then, and this kind of goes with, I think probably the average person reading a long text and, you know, you see it's all caps or something like that. And it's quoting the old Testament or it's, you know, as the scriptures say or something. Yep. Like that. And a lot of times it, it's, it's square. It's almost a one-to-one, -one, but there are other times that you go back to it and you're like, Isaiah 53, or you look <laughs> at this thing or Jeremiah or a Psalm and you're like, or even, I mean, we're memorizing Psalm 8 with the kids right now, and you have made him a little lower than God, it says in Psalm 8, but in Hebrews it says you made him a little lower than the angels. Now, is the author of Hebrews quoting directly? I mean, maybe I can ask you now, is Hebrews a sermon? Is that is that correct? Most people believe it's Could a well sermon. Could well be, yes. Okay. And so, obviously, I preach. I'm a pastor. You know, you've, you've certainly preached many times and taught and stuff. You're going to say something. So, do you think right there... Though he's under the inspiration of the Spirit, explain a little bit, even like, you know, the, the I think I forget where it is in the Old Testament, but out of Egypt, I called my son. But then is it Matthew or is it Luke that uses that talking Matthew, about Christ? Yeah. Matthew. So Matthew references that as a prophecy about <clears throat> Jesus. But in the Old Testament, 
it it's like how do i wait is that talking about jesus what's he, what's matthew doing when he's kind of taking these old testament texts or the author of hebrews or somebody like that what what's going on there when they're they yeah. seem to be playing fast and loose with the bible and therefore you know us 21st century americans we like everything in a box like oh mm-hmm. that's not that's not good and then somebody else looks at that and says yeah that's why i reject the bible and jesus i don't I, it's all a mess i don't like it it's contradictions what, what well is, you what can probably still put it in a box you just have to change the boxes <laughs> yeah. um those are actually two two very good examples because they sort of get at um the two major kinds of questions mm-hmm. that we need to ask um, the first example, um, the Psalm 8 one, has to do with um, when a New Testament writer, whose writings we have only in Greek, um, refers to an Old Testament passage that is identifiable. Were they looking at a Greek copy? Um, we call it the Septuagint. <clears throat> and then either copying it verbatim or uh, editing it in some way? Were they looking at the Hebrew mm. and then making their own translation into Greek? Um, and then that question subdivides because more than one version of the Septuagint has been discovered Mm -hmm. and there are minor differences among those versions. The discovery of portions uh, of every Old Testament book except Esther in the Hebrew uh, copies of the Bible found at the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a window into what is at times a thousand years older Hebrew than we previously had access to. And sometimes the uh, results are that uh, the later Hebrew is remarkably similar to what we find at Qumran at the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but sometimes it's remarkably different. Hmm. Um, so would a first century Christian have been reading a Hebrew text that looked more like what we find among the Dead Sea Scrolls than among the later so-called Masoretic texts? So all of those reflect one cluster of questions that you have to address and Sometimes it's as simple as realizing that uh, the Hebrew Elohim, which can mean God, but it is a plural and it can also mean small g gods, can in various contexts inside and outside of the Bible also mean angels. So um, interesting. Okay. Somebody, uh, whoever wrote Hebrews, had reason to think <clears throat> that angels was uh, the right way to take that passage and, and made his point on that basis. The other kind of question that you bring up <clears throat> is once I have a pretty good idea of the passage a New Testament writer is citing and in what version, what form of interpretation, what form of hermeneutic um, is he employing? There are plenty of texts that we often think of as prophetic. A New Testament writer will use the language of fulfillment um, that say something is going to happen in the future in the Old Testament, and the New Testament says, hey, guess what? It happened. Um, Probably related to something having to do with Jesus. But there are also plenty of texts that imply every bit as common and well understood uh, interpretive principle in those days 
that has come to be known as typology, um, a type, a pattern, um, where the New Testament writer who has already come to believe in Jesus, who is now writing to fellow Christians, trying to give them Christian truth and teaching, sees in something that was very theologically significant in the Old Testament, often having to do with creation or redemption. Look at that. Hosea 11.1, 1, which, by the way, right in that verse tells us he's talking about Israel, mm -hmm. not Jesus. Right. Not using any future tense verbs, not making any predictions, using past tense narrative, says, out of Egypt, I called my son. The collective people of Israel when they left <coughs> Egypt at the time of the Exodus. So what's going on in Matthew's head? Well, I imagine it like this. Huh. When God gave his original covenant to his people, he did so in the context of a dramatic rescue, something unlike anything they had seen in at least 400 years, but something which throughout our Jewish history has come to be recognized as, as the paradigm, as the classic example. You, you can't get any better than this if you want to talk about God redeeming his people. Mm, yeah. All you have to do is say, hey, Richard, you feel like you need to come out of Egypt? And if you're in the know, you know that I'm saying you look like you have a headache. You want to get over that. <laughs> um, now, along comes a man who did enough to convince us that he was the anointed Messiah. And there's this bizarre little story that we learned of how he and his family had to escape Israel to go to Egypt when he was about two years old. Mm. And then, because they didn't want to stay living there when it was safe, they came out of Egypt. Mm. And this is the man who, among all the different titles people are calling him, one of them is the Son of God. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now I start to hear eerie music playing in the background. <laughs> nee, 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 nee. No, this is spooky. Yeah. This isn't just coincidence. This is a sign of God's providential patterns of acting in history. Mm. And we're meant to notice it. Gotcha. No, that's good. I think, okay, that's really helpful uh, because, yeah. again, so I think sometimes people will just. You know, they'll either brush past it and not really ask, you know, for fear of there's not an answer or a good answer or, oh, no, this means there's a contradiction or or man is superseding God or the Bible is just written by human hands and not superintended and carried along by the Holy Spirit speaking from God. And so I think but again, that goes back to what we were speaking a while ago with with faith. You're still taking these things as faith. And I mean, I often will say like, well, what's say the Bible's just man's opinion then what else do you have? You don't have some other real thing that's contending. I mean, maybe some Muslims might say, no, the Quran is, is God's word or something. Sure. But most people, especially skeptics and just kind of wishy-washy, good American Western people who just want to live a quote unquote good life. They don't have anything else. You know, the works of Dar Dawkins or Darwin or, or, or Hawking or anybody else. This isn't God's word. This isn't really going to help you and really show you who you are, why you have a problem, that there's a solution to your problem. And then that solution is not you, but God himself. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, these things, you're still, you're still out of luck, as it were, as the phrase goes. 
And, you know, so there, there is a level of like, well, I trust God that this is his word as well. Right. I mean, because, you know, if we're proving everything, which sometimes apologetics can go a little too far, in my estimation, where you're trying yes. to prove everything. It's like, well, at the end of the day, I'm still going to believe that Jesus. I never saw him. I never saw him born. You didn't see him born. Nobody living today. Nobody even saw him resurrect, even in his day. Right. That's so right. but they still believe it. And like you just said, and that's a good point that he God is acting in history. And there's a real, we're not talking about Gnostic where, you know, Jesus is God in a body or he's floating around or he only appeared to be God or it's just an illusion or any of these other things. We're talking about real second person Godhead adding humanity to himself and then not just doing it on Thursday and getting crucified Friday and then Mm -hmm. leaving on Sunday, but for 30 some odd years and then hanging out for another 40 days afterward just to prove to everybody, okay, this is me. I'm going to go now because, you know, 40 days, biblical number, all that. Like it's it's once you kind of really lay it on the table, it it I think it's encouraging and exciting personally. So um, sounds like you're a good preacher. <laughs> well, I try to be. I hope I am. Um, I want to ask you one last question. I didn't put it in the little description uh, or when we were talking earlier. What do you drum roll? And this might get some people mad. I don't know. Uh, what do you think about the TV, as it were, TV series, The Chosen? I have to say that um, except for the very first episode, um, I've not watched it. Okay. Um, not because I had any reason not to. Um, I just don't watch much TV in the first place. I have lots of other things I do in life. Yeah. From that first episode and from talking with people I trust and uh, who are good critics and who have watched a lot of it, um, seems like there's a lot of good things to to applaud. And I've had uh, pastors tell me that uh, people came to their churches for the first time and mm. said, we're here because we watch the chosen and, and we want to learn more. Hmm. Um, so is it inerrant? Probably not. Um, but sounds to me with the, the little bit that I'm aware of that it's been a very good thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Do you have, we have any closing thoughts on, uh, these kind of questions we'd be talking about just <laughs> how we've gotten the bible and just any glass words you want to give people and maybe some well book re- book recommendations too, uh, either your own or others uh what where can people go to and kind of check out a few different things well you're right i i did write a, a pretty big book that came out in 2016 called the historical reliability of the new testament one that's only about half as big the second edition came out in 09 is called historical reliability of the gospels Mm. Um, I think what strikes me more and more in our overly digitally saturated age is the impossibility of anyone really becoming an expert on many things other than something they may well have studied for years on end. Mm. But because there is so much information available at (laughs) the tip of our fingers on the keyboard, we delude ourselves into thinking that we're experts on a whole lot more Mm. than we really are. And one of the ways to diagnose that is to pick something that in your heart of hearts, you would like to be true, but you don't know if it is. Mm -hmm. And pick something in your heart of hearts that you really hope is false, but you don't know that it is. And ask, do I do the same amount of digging for the one 
as I do for the other. Hmm. Um, or another way is if my physical life <clears throat> is in question or that of somebody I love, and I have the slightest reason to suspect some medical advice I've been giving, I will look for a second, third opinion. Mm -hmm. I will ask around um, based on where I live and what my resources are. I will try to find the absolute best um, help that I can because my life depends on it. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't people all the more take far more seriously getting second and third and fourth opinions about their spiritual lives. Mm, amen. And that cuts right down the, the middle of the divide. <clears throat> I once, uh, years ago, had a conversation with a churchgoer who was old enough to be my dad back then. And he said, do you believe in the errancy of the Bible? I said, yeah, do you? Oh, absolutely. And because I'd built a little bit of a relationship with him, I, I said, so, so what do you do with the alleged contradictions, say, among gospel parallels? What alleged contradictions? And I started giving him some examples this man had lived 60 years, brought up in a Christian home, and had no clue that well-educated scholarly people in universities around the world had read these books, realized they were not verbatim the same, and debated the significance of why they were different. Mm -hmm. Wow. He needs, <laughs> he needed to get a second, third, and fourth opinion as well, because tragically, those are the kind of people who then fall prey to the opposite experience. Mm. Um, and I think of another uh, couple I knew who seemed to be strong Christians. It served overseas come home, retired, had more time on their hands, got into surfing the internet and said, I had no idea. Did you realize that between his teaching in the temple at age 12 and the beginning of his public ministry at age 30, Jesus spent time in India and studied with Indian sages and gurus. And Christianity is really just an offshoot and parasitic on Hinduism and Buddhism. I am so um, wow. disillusioned that not one of my pastors throughout my whole life ever taught me this. And you just want to cry out and say, do you ever think there might have been a reason why that didn't happen? What, what is it that's gone so horribly wrong in your life that you're willing to see one website, which could have been put up by anybody without any accountability, and suddenly agree with that and reject everything you were ever taught before? Um, yeah. I feel like I have heard as my daughters who are now in their thirties were growing up. I feel like I heard more rhetoric in their schooling, which was a combination of private and public schools about teaching critical thinking. Mm. And I see less of it after that generation than probably in the history of our country. Wow. We have failed to do that in our education. Hmm. No, that's, that's true. <laughs> that is abundantly true. Um, besides those two books, you mentioned the reliability uh, of the new Testament and the gospels, both two different books. Do you have any other suggestions? Uh, no, yeah. I mean, those are, are both bigger books. Um, there will be people that 
I want to start with something like uh, Lee Strobel's Case for Christ, which uh, is now um, 26 years old. Wow. And again, uh, you're stuck with the first two chapters where he interviewed me, but he went on to interview a bunch of other people <laughs> nice. and did so at a level that uh, anybody in high school can understand. Yeah. Nice. Well, good. No, I, I again, I, I appreciate this time. I hope this is helpful for everyone. Um, I hope so, too. Yeah. Yeah. Check out everybody. Check out uh, Dr. Craig Blomberg. He's got a ton of work. You can just search your work on it, Amazon or Christian book. I mean, your, your work's all over the place. Have you, you've done commentaries too. I'm not remembering which ones though. Um, I have done commentaries in different series on Matthew and first Corinthians and James. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, I think I appreciate it. Um, that's it. Yeah. You have all a right. great, everybody great. have a great day and uh, take care. Okay.